This video is about poles, zeros, and residues of complex functions. We'll make the assumption here that our function f, which is f of z, a complex number, has isolated singularities. What that means is that f is analytic except at a set of points S and for which if Z naught is in S then there is an open set containing Z naught and no other point of S. The picture looks something like this. Here's the complex plane. And here are some points of S. And if I pick an open set, I only get one of them in there. So particularly what I am excluding is I am excluding the situation where where uh, we have a sequence of points oops a sequence of points that tend to Z naught. In this case here, no open set containing Z naught alone. So this is not what we're talking about. Okay, so with that ground rule aside, let me first of all tell you, give you a definition. z naught equals zero. If that happens, z naught is called a zero of f. Now, that's pretty straightforward. f is going to be analytic there because it's not necessarily badly defined. Probably. It may not be analytic there, but probably. And <coughs> On the other hand, if places where f is not analytic uh, are potential problems. And what a pole is, is a particular kind of problem that's kind of benign. So it's going to be isolated. So a pole of f of z is a point z naught in s. So it is a place where f is not analytic and where the Laurent series of F is of the form. So we're going to write a Laurent series centered at Z naught. So we have the Taylor series part. There's no problems there. That's perfectly analytic at Z naught. The trouble happens here. Uh, happens here. In fact, you know what? Just to distinguish what's going on here, I'll call that M. And in particular, you will notice it stops. It doesn't go on to minus infinity in terms of powers of the z's. So there is a there's a there's an endpoint there. So this is called a pole if it has this form. 
This is a pole of order m. Said to be a pole of order m. And the coefficient b1 is special. This is called the residue of f at z0. And the residue is kind of special because, in particular, there's a, a lemma. The lemma is if I take the integral around any closed curve, closed contour of f of z, and this contour is a positive, simple, closed contour around z naught and no other point of s. If I compute that, I get 2 pi i times b1 the residue. We usually write this as 2 pi i residue at z naught of f of z. That's usually the notation we'll use. Now the reason why this lemma is true and does not pick up all those other guys, well first of all you'll notice if I use this Lenat series the Taylor series part doesn't play any role because the cauchy grisat theorem tells you that's integral is going to be zero. All the other guys, on the other hand, perhaps surprisingly, end up being zero, too. The function is not analytic there, for sure, so the cauchy grisat theorem does not apply. It still works out. So it's worth doing a little bit of a computation there to see that. So proof. The terms with z minus z naught to the n for n greater than or equal to zero contribute oops that was interesting contribute zero to the contour integral by the Cauchy theorem. Okay, that's good. Then, well, let's take one of these particular guys around, say, bn over z minus z naught dz, and this is to the power m. We can parameterize this, so choose Oops. Choose z equal to r e to the i theta plus z naught to traverse our contour. This r here is constant. This is constant. That means when we change variables, dz will equal r i e to the i theta d theta, in more or less the usual way. And so our integral then, when we parameterize it this way, will be 0 to 2 pi bm over r e to the i theta plus z naught minus z naught to the m r i e to the i theta d theta. Sounds good thus far. And now we just need to compute. A little bit of simplification. You'll notice the z naughts cancel. And the denominator turns into an r to the m, e to the i m theta, d theta. The r's 
kind of come out in the wash a bit, so I get an R to the 1 minus M, BM, well that's a constant, and there's an I, 0 to 2 pi, and as far as what's left is an exponential, E to the I theta times, and now there's something special going on here, uh, this is a 1 minus M, D theta. You'll notice, kind of implied in how I wrote this, m is greater than 0. So you get two possibilities here. If, if m is equal to 0, this will be this will be some number. Uh, this will be, rather, it will be 0 in the exponent. So this will be r1 minus m, b to the m, i. Times a... Uh, times uh, 2, 0, 2 pi, d theta. And otherwise, I'll have an R, 1 minus M, B to the M, I, 0 to 2 pi, E to the I, theta, 1 minus M. This is M equals 1, M greater than 1. If M is equal to 1, one thing you will notice right away is that that R thing here, right, goes away. Why? Because 1 minus 1 is 0. So that's R to the 0, that goes away. Uh, otherwise, this particular expression down below looks just the way it is. So doing some computing here. This, turn, this first one turns into uh, 2 pi i b m if m is equal to 1. Otherwise, uh, this is going to be a 1 over i 1 minus m e to the i theta, 1 minus m, between 0 and 2 pi. The thing to notice here is that uh, e, to the, uh, e to the i theta times some integer, uh, when theta is equal to 0 or 2 pi, are actually the same number. They're both 1. So this whole thing is equal to 0. So the conclusion is just what we asked for. 2 pi i b m if m is equal to 1 or 0 if m is greater than 1. Just as desired. Okay, so what that means then is that means that this lemma here is true and this is why this b1 holds a special place and it's called the residue at z naught.